uh, we're just working our way through the mathematical background. So, we already talked about solving ordinary differential equations using separation of variables. Uh, and so now this is done. Uh, so now we're going to talk about derivatives of vectors and um, the derivatives of vectors that we're going to do right now, we're assuming that we have non-rotating coordinate systems. Non-rotating coordinate systems. And I'll talk about how that comes into it. Um, Uh, then we're going to talk about the product rule and the chain rule. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is the connection. So um, in order to understand why the derivatives that I'm going to talk about right now only apply in non-rotating coordinate systems, uh, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to explain that when we talk about the chain rule. So there's sort of a connection between these two. Okay. All right. So derivatives of vectors in non-rotating coordinate systems. Um, these are easy to calculate, but I just want to make sure everybody uh, knows how to do this. Um, so the reason that this is going to be important, the biggest reason, is these three relationships that are going to come up you know, over and over again. The velocity vector is the time derivative of the position vector. Um, a lot of times you see that just written as p dot. The acceleration vector is the time derivative of the velocity vector. Um, which is v dot. And it's also equal to the second derivative then of the position vector. Or p double dot. And then um, for rotational motion, the angular acceleration vector is the time derivative of the angular velocity vector, or omega dot. Um, OK, so how do you take these derivatives? Um, if you're going to take the time derivative of the vector u so you're taking the time derivative of a vector uh, ux that's a function of time uy that's a function of time and uz that's a function of time then that's just equal to the time derivatives of each of the individual components. So, you know, you have ux dot, uy dot, uz dot. So, for example, um, if you know the velocity vector, of a particle is um, defined by t squared 5t cosine t. And you want to know what the acceleration vector is. 
as a function of time. Then you're just going to take the time derivatives of each of these components. So the acceleration vector is just 2t, 5, and then negative sine t. Michael never likes the first three minutes of class, so he's already covered that material each day. Um, all right, any questions about that? Derivatives of vectors? And now the product rule. For scalars, the time derivative of x times y, um, another way you see this written is x times y, all of that uh, with a dot over it. So let's see it written with that line over it and then a dot. And so this is the one that you, you learn in Calc 1. Uh, so this is x dot y plus x y dot. But the, one, the ones that you at least haven't seen as often as that one is uh, first the scalar times a vector. So there we're talking about like x times a vector y time derivative. Um, a dot product of two vectors. So there we're talking about a vector. Oops. So a vector x. dotted with a vector y and the time derivative of those. And then the cross product so x crossed with y and then the time derivative of that. And notice that these all just end up having the same form as this. Um, so if you have a scalar times a vector, that means you multiply the time derivative of the scalar times the vector, and then add that to the scalar times the time derivative of the vector. And the dot product, you have x dot dotted with y, add that to x, whoops, x dotted with y dot. And then the cross product, um, you have x dot crossed with y plus x crossed with y dot. So let's make sure that uh, all of these types of objects make sense. You know, you can't add a vector to a scalar. Um, so that means that in all of these versions of the product rule, you need to have um, the same type of object, a scalar or a vector on one side of the addition that you do on the other side. Um, all right, so if you look back at the derivative of a vector, um, if you take the time derivative of a vector, well, really any kind of derivative of a vector, uh, what kind of object do you get out of it, a scalar or a vector? You get a vector out, right? That's how it had to be because of these relationships. A vector is a... a Velocity is a vector, position is a vector, acceleration is a vector. So the time derivative doesn't change those quantities. Um, and so uh, 
let's first look at this product rule for scalars. Time derivative of a scalar is a scalar. So you have a scalar times a scalar. So this whole thing is a scalar. Scalar times a scalar. So this whole thing is a scalar. So you can add those. And so what do you get out of the product rule? A scalar or a vector. Scalar. Scalar times a vector. What's x dot? So x is a scalar, y is a vector. What type of quantity is x dot? It's a scalar. What's y? Vector. What's x? What's y? Vector. So you have a vector here, a vector here, so you can add those. So a scalar times a vector, if you take that time derivative, you get a vector out. Dot product. Um, well, think of it this way. So when you take a dot product of two vectors, what object do you get out? Scalar. So we need to have scalars on both sides of this addition. X dot is a vector. Y is a vector. Take the dot product, you get a scalar for this one. Uh, X is a vector. Y dot is a vector. You get a scalar here, and those add. And so you're final quantity is a scalar. And then cross product, um, the cross product of two vectors, is that a scalar or a vector? Vector, so vector here, vector here, they add and give you a vector. Um, so as an example, let's say that you want to take the time derivative of cosine t, sine t, zero, crossed with zero, zero, t squared. Um, so you're going to take, so if we call this one the vector u, this one the vector v, um, u dot is equal to negative sine t, positive cosine t, 0, and v dot is equal to 0, 0, 2t. So this is just going to be equal to u dot cross v plus u cross v dot. Um, and from these you get uh, so you get p squared cosine t, negative t squared sine t, 0, plus 2t sine t, and then the y component is 2t cosine t, 0. And so your vector output is t squared cosine t plus 2t sine t. That's the x component. The y component is 
negative t squared sine t plus 2t cosine t, 0. Um, OK, so that's the answer using the product rule. Um, now for the check. What's u cross v? The x component is t squared sine t. The y component is t squared cosine t. And the z component is 0. And so now we can take the time derivative of that. And we get 2t sine t uh, plus t squared cosine t. The y component is negative 2. Uh, yeah, positive, uh, where am I? Positive 2t cosine t minus t squared sine t, and derivative of 0 is 0. And these are in different orders, but these two things are equal. Well, I, okay, so I did that time derivative. So there's two ways to do this. Um, one way is you can just, we want to take the time derivative of the cross product of this. So first do the cross product and then just take the time derivative of what you get. Okay. The second way is to use the product rule um, on these two vectors that have, that are, you know, use the product rule to calculate the time derivative without multiplying it out first. So the first way I did it was using the product rule and I got this. The second way was I took the cross product of u and v and then took the time derivative of what I got here. And these match. So now you believe me and before you didn't. Okay. The 2t, uh, this, oh yeah, you're right, um, so how, what did I do twice? Oh, I, uh, I did that in all my cross products, I guess. So, um, this should be positive. This should be negative. This should be positive. This should be negative. And then that matches. So I just forgot to do. And Kathy, why is that? It's yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because because uh, in any kind of vector calculation, y always has to be the difficult one. So so that's why um, if you cross ux, uy, and uz with vx, vy, and vz, this is equal to Uy vz minus uh, uz vy. The z component is ux vy minus uy vz. So there's like a nice simple 
similarity between those and y thinks like it sort of goes along. This is ux vz minus uz vx, but then y just has to get in its little, it has to be a little bit different. It's got to be the one who wears like two different colored Chuck Taylors, you know? Like, just wear the same color Chuck Taylors. No, Y has to be a little different. All right. Any questions about the chain rule? Or the, sorry, that's the product rule. All right, now we're going on to the chain rule. And the chain rule says this. If you take the time derivative of a function of all these different variables, where all of these variables really are hidden functions of t, so it doesn't matter how many of these you have, um, so dot, 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 z of t, and you want to take that time derivative, that's equal to the partial of f with respect to x times dx dt plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt plus, keep going, as many variables as you have, the partial of f with respect to z times dz dt. So for example, Say you want to find f dot where f of x, y is equal to x squared plus x, y, okay? And then x and y are actually sort of hidden functions of, um, of time. So x of t, let's say, is equal to t squared. And y of t is equal to sine t. OK, so um, this is kind of a cooked example where um, there's two ways to do it. Obviously, you could just first substitute x and y into this function f and then take the derivative using the product rule. Um, but I just want to show how this chain rule works. And though there are going to be actually a lot of problems that we do where um, there's no way to do the problem except with the chain rule. Um, and we'll get into that when we talk about particle kinematics. Um, OK, so f dot is equal to the partial of f with respect to x times dx dt plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt. What's the partial derivative of f with respect to x? So yeah, that's 2x plus y. So the way you do that is you just, um, you assume that anything except x, you treat it like a constant in here. Um, so if the y here was actually a constant c, the derivative would be 2x plus c. And so that's the way you do this. And then dx dt is equal to 2t 
And now the partial of f with respect to y, what's that equal to? Yeah, so now you assume that everything is a constant except for y. So if this is a constant, you take its derivative, you, you get 0. If x here is a constant, you take the derivative with respect to y, and you get x. So this is x times dy dt, which is cosine of t. And now if you wanted it to be a function of t, you could plug the values, you know, the functions for x and y in for x and y here and here. And then you could compare to the way you do it by making these substitutions before you started taking the derivatives, and they match. Any questions about that? Okay, so I want to bring up something. I think we're going to get to a problem like this today, hopefully. Um, so something to notice about the chain rule. This is going to come up a lot in this class in one particular kind of problem. Um, so in this class, the chain rule often arises um, when um, you are given the velocity vector as a function of position in some way. Um, I'll say, you know, as a function of x. It could be a function of y. It's just it's not a function of time. So at first glance, so say you know this and you want to find the acceleration function, okay? So at first thought, you think, well, acceleration is just the derivative of v, but there's a big problem with that. Acceleration is the time derivative of v, not, you know, dv dx. So you can't just take the derivative of this function v and get the, deriv the acceleration out of that. What? Yeah, you can do that, but then you get it all wrong. Um, so what you have to do is recognize that the acceleration is dv dt, and the chain rule says that that is dv dx times dx dt. And then, you know, that's equal to, so this is something you can calculate. And this goes back to something that has to do with velocity, and you can get that from the fact that you know the velocity function. So this is some aspect of the velocity. And we have a function for that. Okay, so an example of how to do this. Say that the velocity vector is the function x squared 2x. And we want to know um, what's the acceleration vector at the point when x is equal to 5. Okay. Um, well, I'm treating x here as if um, that refers to, you know, the x component of the position vector, like the way we're used to treating it. Um, 
So the position vector we'd think of is x, y. The velocity vector is this. So then the acceleration vector is dv dx times dx dt. dv dx is 2x2. dx dt is the x component of the velocity. Because so if the position is x, y, the velocity vector is dx dt dy dt. So dx dt here is just the x component of the velocity. Uh, and that is x squared. And so we get a function out that's 2x to the third, 2x squared. And so now to evaluate that, when x is equal to 2, we have 2 times 2 cubed. That's the x component. The y component is 2 times 2 squared. And so you get 16, 8. Oh, x equals 5, sorry. Uh, so if you did wanted it to, you would do that. Um, Okay, so x is equal to 5, so plug 5 in here, and the values you get now are 250, 50. So this is a case, I mean, that's kind of cool. Like, this is a case where we don't have the velocity expressed in terms of time, but still we manage to calculate the acceleration by taking the time derivative of the velocity vector. Any questions about that? Um, all right. So now let's go on to. Um, Particle kinematics. Uh, let me start by, before I do that, let me just give sort of an outline of topics that we're going to go through. So now that's it for the mathematical background. So here's sort of the order of how we're going to cover things. Um, we're going to start with non-rotating coordinate systems, or um, even more generally, inertial coordinate systems. Um, what are the two ways you can have a non-inertial coordinate system? So first I wrote non-rotating, and then I wrote inertial. Uh, there's one other way you can have a non-inertial coordinate system besides having rotating axes. If the, if the origin is accelerating, even if the axes are in a fixed orientation, then you have a non-inertial coordinate system too. Um, Okay, so we're going to start with inertial coordinate systems. Uh, we're going to start with particle kinematics. Then particle kinetics. Then 
just like in physics one, we're going to go from particles to rigid bodies. So we'll go to rigid body kinematics. Oh, yeah, and uh, so what's the difference between kinematics and kinetics? What is kinematics? Yeah, it's, it's just sort of studying the motion. I think one way to think about it is um, kinematics is all the stuff, the calculations that you could do just based on videoing something. You don't have to know anything about its mass. You don't have to know anything about the forces applied. It just has to do with relationships between position, velocity, acceleration. And uh, then when we go to kinetics, that's when we start to bring in forces and masses and moments, and moments of inertia. So start with kinematics for particles, kinetics for particles, then rigid body, go back to kinematics, then rigid body kinetics. Um, then we'll talk about linkages. So remember in statics, uh, when we took a bunch of rigid bodies and connected them by joints, uh, those were called structures. If you take away one of the supports of a structure, so um, so this is an example of something that we studied in statics, right? You apply some forces to it. It doesn't move anywhere, like if you have a pin here. That's a structure. Well, if we took away some part of this support, like say, for example, that we replaced this pin joint that was connected to the floor with a roller, now you apply that force or let gravity act on it, and it doesn't support those loads, it moves. And uh, so when this was a pin joint with the floor, that was a structure, now this is a linkage. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about energy methods for solving linkages. Um, this is related to virtual work that I just talked about for a second, the last day of class in statics. So energy methods for linkages. For the most part, with energy methods, um, in this class and in statics and in D-form, we're talking about this stuff, energy methods, just as a way to kind of introduce the ideas. Um, it's not something that would be very useful to us yet. Um, but as you go later on, you'll see that those methods, in certain cases, can be really useful. OK, so that's all for dealing with inertial coordinate systems. Then we get into um, non-inertial coordinate systems. Um, our goal is mainly to figure out the physics going on in the Jamiroquai video. Um, and we're going to, so we're not going to do a lot of complicated stuff. The fact that the non inertial coordinate system uh, is, you know, the fact that it's non inertial means it's complicated enough, even with simple motions. So we're just going to deal with. Um, particle kinematics and particle kinetics. So the first topic is particle kinematics.
in, I was going to write non, uh, non-rotating, but let's just call this an inertial coordinate system. Um, and the most important relationships in this section are that the velocity is equal to p dot and the acceleration is equal to v dot which is equal to p double dot. Um, and we're just going to get used to the fact that all of these equations, all of these problems turn into differential equations problems and solving them using the differential equations. Um, so the fact that things become differential equations um, means that these problems are going to require boundary conditions. So when are we going to need to, I guess I said everything's going to be a differential equation, but some problems are going to be, some are not going to be. The ones that are, we're going to need boundary conditions for. So when are we going to need boundary conditions? Um, well, if we're given a position function, and we want to go from the position function to the velocity function or the acceleration function, so if we're moving in this direction to the right, um, then we don't need any boundary conditions because all we're doing is taking derivatives. Um, you can think of it as if you're just taking derivatives, there's no constants of integration. Um, so there's no boundary conditions needed. We're just taking derivatives. But if we're going the other direction, from acceleration to velocity, or velocity to position, we need one boundary condition for each step along the way. So as soon as you recognize that a problem's going in this order from acceleration to velocity to position, um, start looking through the problem for where you're going to get your boundary conditions from. Um, if an object is in free fall, um, which means that the only force acting on the object is gravity, then in an inertial coordinate system like we're using, um, the acceleration vector is 9.81 meters per second squared down. So um, in free fall problems, you're usually going to be going from the fact that you know the acceleration and then integrating, so you're going to need boundary conditions. OK, so let me just do an example of uh, dealing with the differential equations. Um, so remember that. In free fall, you've seen this formula before that says um, 
the position as a function of time and uh, let's say so free fall can be when I talk about free fall I, I mean it generally like the object can be launched out and you know moving uh, moving in a plane um, but let's think about this one just in terms of a straight up and down motion, something falling or being launched into the air. So the position as a function of time is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity times time minus one half g t squared, where g is 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so I'm going to derive that from the, the fact that the acceleration vector is so the acceleration vector is just g acting down or if um, if we have the y-axis pointing up out of the ground, then this is just going to be 0, negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so we know that the y-component of the acceleration is negative g. Um, I have a question. So this is a really important distinction to make in all of these problems. Um, when I say that a y is equal to negative g, am I saying that at some point that's the value, at some instant that's the value, or am I saying that negative g completely defines the acceleration function? Yeah, it's constant. So in this case, so this is constant. So this is the whole acceleration function. Um, a lot of times um, I talk to people who are confused about a problem, and the problem will say something like um, the velocity when uh, when time is equal to 5 is 0, okay? And so the person says, well, the velocity when time is equal to 5 is 0. I can get, say, the acceleration by just taking that derivative. Derivative of 0 is 0, you know? But the problem is, um, the problem with that is that's not saying that if you plotted out the velocity versus time, you'd have zero all the way as time moves. That just means that whatever this thing's doing, at the instant that's mentioned in the problem, the velocity is time, uh, the, the velocity is zero at that instant, okay? But the derivative of this function isn't zero at that instant, okay? So you always, I mean, I think it's a good habit to get into to just, when you see a number, a value, whatever in a problem, ask yourself, is that telling me what the function is as time changes, or is that giving me a single snapshot? Usually, if you get a constant, it's just giving you a single snapshot that you can use as one of your boundary conditions. Okay. All right, so um, how are we going to come up with acceler? Uh, no, we're trying to come up with a position. How are we going to come up with position from this? Yeah, well, we know um, we can write this as the position double dot is equal to negative g. Um, and say that we are given these constants, so what is 
Um, the way it's written in this function is we're given a position constant, a value when time is equal to zero, and we're given a velocity value when time is equal to zero. That's what this p0 and v0 mean. So I'm going to rewrite these as boundary conditions. So we know that um, p, when time is equal to zero, is equal to this value p sub zero. And we know that when time is equal to zero, the velocity is equal to this constant v sub zero. OK, so now we have a differential equation. Uh, what's the independent variable? Yep, time. Uh, what's the dependent variable? Position, that's the function we're trying to find. Um, how many boundary conditions do we need? Two, because we have a second order derivative. Um, and these are our two boundary conditions. So we should be able to solve this. OK, so um, separation of variables. So d p dot is equal to negative g dt. So, um, you know, I re-expressed this as uh, d dt of p dot. And now you can integrate both sides, and you get p dot is equal to negative g t plus c. Or another way to think of this, p dot is equal to v, so you can think of this as v is equal to negative g t plus c. And now do separation of variables again, and you get dp is equal to negative g t plus c dt. And we can integrate both sides of that. And so we get p is equal to negative 1 half g t squared plus c t plus, I guess I'll call this other constant k, I don't know. OK, so that's the function, but that's a general function. That's not taking our boundary conditions into account. Um, so our first boundary condition says when time is equal to 0, p is equal to p sub 0. So we can write that as, so for the boundary conditions, p sub 0 is equal to negative 1 half g times 0 squared plus uh, c times 0 plus k. This is 0. This is 0. And so we get that this constant k is equal to p sub 0. And then uh, the second boundary condition says when time is equal to 0, v is equal to v0. So we can use this equation. And it tells us that v0 is equal to negative g times 0 plus c. So this goes away, and we get that this constant c is equal to v sub 0. And now we can update the equation. We can update the position function. 
that we first got after we finished our separation of variables. And we get that position as a function of time is equal to negative one-half g t squared plus v0 t plus p0. What? Yeah, but I just did it all as a y component. So this is just giving, you know, the y component. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, one thing that I think is really going to help you and I think is important is um, as you're going through these problems, there's a lot of stuff, especially when we start with kind of simple problems like this one. There's a lot of stuff that you're going to see a couple steps ahead of time, and you're going to be sort of drawn to just skipping a couple steps. Get in the habit of thinking about this as a differential equation and going through all the steps with the boundary conditions and stuff, because as we keep going, there are going to be times when it's not as obvious, and you're going to want to feel comfortable with that kind of way of thinking about it. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's take a 10-minute break. Come back at 2.10, and we'll move on.